It's a great year for snowmobiling. We've got plenty of snow and plenty of trails to ride. 906 Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. One day and you see the stuff that you don't ever see on a snowmobile. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. <music> 906 Outdoors is brought to you in part by Crest, your Northwoods neighborhood store. Nearly half of Michigan's 6,300 miles of snowmobile trails are located here in the Upper Peninsula and are known as some of the best in the country. These trails are groomed with volunteer help by clubs and organizations of various types from one end of the UP to the other. One such club that dates back to the earliest days of trail grooming is the Normanco Sportsman's Club in Powers. I hopped on board one of their groomers with volunteer operator Jason Hubbard for a closer look at what's involved in trail grooming. I want to say it was probably six or seven years ago I joined the club, Lermanko's club. Um, I was always a big snowmobiler and you look at clubs are older gentlemen that are retirement age that do a lot of the work. I had a job where I work a swing shift where I work 14 days a month so I figured it'd be time to start helping out and I joined and this is my third year of helping groom. I really enjoy it, it kind of gets me out. Uh, a co-worker of mine, the guy that I snowmobile with, he's been coming with me this year, kind of just to have somebody in here. It gets my daughter, when she doesn't have school, she's six years old and she loves coming out and doing this with us. And then a couple days later, we'll come and jump on the snowmobiles and ride the trails. And she says, you know, this is, uh, she helped groom it, she always says, which makes her and hopefully someday that she'll be a part of the club and she can take over when I'm getting old and don't want to do it anymore. It's a fun day. You get out and see everything. You see stuff that, that you don't ever see on a snowmobile. That's for sure. You know, a snowmobile, you might as well figure you're traveling this, usually 25, 30, some people go faster. You know, you're sitting here about 10, 8 to 10 miles an hour. You see a lot more, you know, you see a lot of wildlife that I like. You know, everybody seems to be nice, give you a thumbs up because they enjoy what you do for them. You know, that makes the job easier. Normanco Sportsman's Club uh, formed probably in the early 70s. Uh, started grooming trails uh, right shortly after that. They originally started off with the little John Deere uh, bulldozer pulling a drag. Uh, then they stepped up to an Army 6x6, stuck more often than not. And then uh, the big thing came when uh, Joe Nowak and Willard Leger uh, manufactured what we call the new type uh, groomer. It was a Volkswagen engine with three snowmobile tracks and uh, it was on skis, hydraulic steering. It was all over the trail. It took me twice as long to get anywhere because you had to anticipate your uh, steering. Then, boy, I think it would have been in the early 80s or mid 80s, uh, we ended up uh, with one of the new brand spanking new Tuckers. And then you go to something like this. Uh, a $200,000 machine that uh, this is what we use now. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Race Driven, your source for premier power sports products. Well, this machine, I believe, is a 2015 
Tucker. It has four tracks on it, gets you across the snow. It has a nice blade on it for leveling, getting at the roadways, or cutting the bigger humps down before the drag does. Our drag is an arrowhead drag. There's blades on it. It cuts the mound and it kind of processes the snow, they call it. It knocks the air out of it. And there's a big pan on the backside that makes it flat. It's like a big paver metal, but kind of like dragging a piece of plywood across the snow with some weight on it. Now with the blades, you can kind of see that they're angled. The front ones are the same, but then they're offset. So the snow kind of flows through everything. This is the pan that I was talking about. It levels it and then that is your finished product when you're done. Now, as you can see right now, if you step on it, it's a little harder, but it's not set up perfect. You give it about a half hour, 45 minutes, she'll be pretty hard. You know, the front hitch helps a lot. Some of our trails are railroad grades and it's nice to have the front wheels. It kind of helps you stabilize it so it doesn't slide around too much. You know, this is like a big sled, so it does have a tendency if you get in the right train, it will slide off the trail or slide off wherever you're at. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't look like it would, but there's a lot of weight there. These three buttons are for the drag in the back. This farthest one over is the lower and raise the back wheels. The middle one is for the front wheels. And then this one is for lifting the uh, um, hitch up. The hitch is um, hydraulically driven. And then the big joystick here, it raises and lowers the blade. And this blade goes back and forth and then side to side. And then we have our instrument panel, like a normal vehicle with the RPM gauge, mile per hours, oil temperature, water temperature. You can get different graphs where your peak horsepower is and all that. Similar to a semi, it has a Cummins engine, similar, similar to a lot of the semis out there. Now this is automatic transmission. I think some of the older ones were manual transmissions like the old trucks were. It even has cruise control so you can set the cruise at a certain speed. We maintain 115 miles of snowmobile trail, so we actually need three of them, but we've only got two. And uh, we just carry on and uh, do the best we can, generally grooming three times a week. And we have about eight to 10 operators, uh, and they're all volunteers, and uh, all pretty much mechanically inclined and uh, maintain the equipment and the trails. It's not just a three-month deal. It's basically a, almost a 12-month deal because we do have to uh, brush the 115 miles. So we've got uh, tractors and we've got bulldozers. And um, the club has come from uh, basically uh, just a, a group of guys starting it to now quite an operation. And uh, it's all volunteer. And our club does uh, have a banquet once a year. Uh, funding from uh, that goes to different organizations, goes to different uh, scholarships. Uh, it's just a it's just a good club. We have uh, close to 200 members, and they're scattered all over the United States. Uh, and as any club, we probably have about 30 really good active members. try to get everything groomed twice a week, you know, when we have enough help. Sometimes they only get once a week, sometimes they get them three times a week. And we try to get them out earlier in the week and then we try to get them Thursday, Friday so they're nice and smooth for the weekend again. Last year it seemed like every time I went out it was the next couple days after I went out it was melted. 
you know, you were 30 degrees this year. I've been out probably, I think it's been eight, 10 times. And it seemed like every time I've been out, except for once, it's been all fresh snow. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. The trails maintained by the Normanco Sportsman's Club begin at Veterans Park, one mile west of the junction of US-2 and US-41 in Powers. Basically in the summertime, this is our ATV trailhead. In the wintertime, snowmobile trailhead. They have all the parking here. Uh, summertime restrooms. The reason they made the sign here was because we had problems with vehicles driving on the ATV trails and it's set up the same as what all the ATV trails are, 65 inch width. In the summer we close the gates on the sides of the sign to limit the width of the vehicles going through it. We don't have any problems as far as vandalism or anything else in here other than people driving on the trail. The trailhead from here, a little bit of a sketchy route getting into Powers from here, but they go to Arnold, Escanaba, La Branche, Schaefer, the whole western part of the UP from here. Most of the time I go out at, during the day, but I also been out a couple times this year at night and just the difference. You can be on the same trail, but you see everything at a different perspective. You know, an average run, I think this one is right around, I think it's right around between 60 and 70 miles and right around six and a half to seven hours. Depends how the snow conditions are, can be more, can be last. It's a big thing staying on the right side of the corner when you're going through it because if we come around the corner and hit you, it's going to hurt. You know, it's hard during the day to see the lights. At night you can see the lights coming pretty good. Running with the four ways on with the strobe lights and all the lights on here, it's lighting up the day pretty good. Um, during the day, it's the best thing just to stay right and you know, we can stop, but we can't get off the trail as easy as a snowmobiler can. The groomer has rights at all times, so if you meet a groomer, you have to get off the trail for them. So they can pass you, unless they motion for you and get by you. I know our drag, I believe it's 8 foot 6 wide, and most of these trails aren't much wider than 12 foot. So, you know, we take up a lot of room. You know, this year, a lot of these branches, when we started grooming in January, didn't even hit. But now, with, I don't know what the base is, but we probably got a good two foot base on here. If not more, makes a big difference how tall everything is. Normanco Sportsman's Club was uh, uh, grooming trails long before there were any DNR contracts or designated trails. It was just the founding fathers here um, we're all snowmobilers. We had a couple of the uh, members uh, that sold snowmobiles and repaired snowmobiles, so they uh, had trails from Powers to La Branche and other places that uh, it was just because they wanted the trails, not because they were getting paid for it. Uh, that didn't come in, into play until probably the mid 80s or something where the contracts start coming out. So that was the start of grooming in the Upper Peninsula, just guys going out and making groomers and making trails. Starting on Thursday nights, you know, you start meeting more of the guys, younger group, you know, they're going out for 
supper, just going for a ride that um, tend to like to tear up the trails after you groom them. It's all possible. It's nice if a snowmobiler can stay off the freshly groomed trail as long as possible. Then it gives it time to set up and gives you a nice firm trail that everybody likes to ride, nice smooth firm trail. When it comes to ice fishing, there's a variety of tools of the trade. Here's some thoughts on the benefits of using a depth finder. Most of these fish are suspended four to five feet from the bottom. Normally, you know, most people's thinking is we're gonna fish six or eight inches off the bottom. If you do that, you're dropping past the fish and you're fishing below them. With this, you can see that fish, you know, where he is in the water column, and then you uh, can target him directly where he's, where he's at. And without that, you're just fishing blind, you're guessing. It's a big difference. These two lines here go up and down, that's my lure. And the solid line, that's a fish. As you jig your line above him, a lot of times you know you see him come up or you go down. See he's moving following my line. Now there's another one appearing on the bottom. You can put your lure right to him, but you'll see them start to follow it. And as they, when they get closer on it, they'll turn like that red, distinguishes size. But you see he came right to the lure followed it right up, be right on top of it. See this one coming? He's coming right at it. There he is. Just that easy. Oh, that's a good one too. Fun fish. 906 Outdoors is brought to you in part by Blades Bait and Tackle, your hard water connection to Little Baity Knock. When it comes to eating fish, walleyes are at or near the top of the favorites menu for most folks. And in most cases, you'll find them battered or breaded, deep fried, and on a plate next to some fries and a side of coleslaw. But of course, there's more than one way to skin a fish. So I was back in the kitchen with Mary Malner. So today we're going to be making a walleye chowder. It's going to be fabulous. You're going to love it. First thing I want to do is I've got some bacon that I'm just kind of getting crispy. And I'm going to take this out and drain it. It's not going to be totally healthy today. And then we're just going to pour a little bit of this right in here. We're just going to keep that nice and warm, and then we're going to sweat out the vegetables. So the first thing I'm going to do is season my walleye with a little bit of just Old Bay seasoning. We're just going to kind of pan sear this a little bit, and then we're going to chop up some onions and some celery and get our chowder going. So I've just got some sweet onions, some Regular celery, we'll sweat these out as the walleye is going to be cooking. Get that in there. Walleye is absolutely one of my favorite fish. Whenever we go out to eat anywhere, I always order walleye. My husband's a perch kind of guy, and I'm always a walleye kind of gal. Just love it. Nothing better. Okay, so we're just going to get this fish in here real quick. These are some nice small pieces here. We're not going to um, cook these very long. We don't want it to dry out. So you can see it's starting to cook already on the edges. Doesn't take very long here. While that's going, I'm going to just chop a couple cloves of garlic. Put that in. And now we're gonna flip our fish. It's almost done. Okay, so while that's going, I'm going to chop up some Yukon Gold potatoes. We're going to use a little chopper that makes quick work. They're all the same size. Makes it really, really simple and quick. Okay, so we've got our vegetables kind of sweated out a little bit. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add our potatoes and I'm going to add some vegetable broth. Now you could use bone broth or a chicken stock if you wanted to. I'm going to use a vegetable stock and I'm going to bring that up to a, to a boil and I'm just covering the vegetables there. So all I'm doing is just kind of breaking this up a little bit into big chunks here. Because we're using potatoes we're going to have to salt um, and layer a couple of times. We're going to do a little bit of thyme. I love thyme with a, a potato chowder and I'm going to do one drop of thyme oil. 
just because it really brightens it. And then I like to toss in just one bay leaf. And we'll dig that out before we serve it. A lot of recipes call for a thickening agent, which would be like, um, you could mix a little bit of the vegetable broth or a flour and make a roux and kind of thicken it that way. I don't want to do, I don't want to use any um, flour or any wheat in here. Um, so I'm going to just do it with a russet potato and that'll break it down. It's real starchy. It's going to break it down and it'll just be real nice and creamy after we add the half and half in the heavy cream. Just a russet that's already shredded and I've had it soaking in cold water. We're just going to put a little bit of that in and this is going to be our thickening agent. So as that cooks, that russet will break down and just make it nice and creamy. So we use the Yukon Golds because they'll hold their shape better. That or a red potato would be really good. If you use just a russet, it would totally break down. So that's why we shredded it to use it for the thickening agent in here. So we just have to wait for this to come to a boil. Can you see how thick this is starting to get? As this russet's starting to break down, the broth is getting real nice consistency to it. We're gonna take the bay leaf out and I'm going to just blend this. A little. I'm not gonna blend the whole thing. We're just gonna do a little bit. Okay, that's all we wanna do. We're gonna add our half and half. Uh, we've got about a cup and a half in here. That's gonna give you the, the nice fat mouthfeel. And then I'm gonna add just a little bit of heavy cream too. And that'll make it really nice and creamy. About a quarter cup. And there again, at the end, you can kind of, um, depending on how thick it is, add a little bit more if you want to. We just want to simmer it. We don't want to bring it to a boil because we don't want that heavy cream to break. And then it'll look like it's um, a little bit curdled and, and stuff. So we want to just keep it at a real nice low simmer. Now we're going to stir in the fish. We want to add this right at the end because we don't want it to totally break down. Fish is pretty delicate, so we don't want it to break down all the way. So, let's ladle up a bowl. When we serve it, we'll ladle it up in the bowls and then we'll top it with the green onion and the bacon. A little bit of parsley. And there we have our walleye chowder.